guys, I'm Trina and today I'm doing a book review over A Game of Thrones by George R. R. Martin. This is book number one in the A Song of Ice and Fire series. Right now there are five books out and there are seven planned. This is my first time reading the book but I have seen the show. The order of this review is going to be a summary of the book, my general impressions and rating, who I would recommend it to, how the TV show and the book compare to each other, and then a more in-depth discussion of of themes and theories. So let's start right off with the summary. I'm sure that you have heard about this, but I'm going to give you my spit on things. If you're a person who doesn't like summaries, then you can mute or skip ahead until I put the book down. A Game of Thrones is very much the story of a kingdom, and once upon a time there were this ruling family who ruled for years and years, and the last of their kings kind of went mad. So a bunch of other noble families rose up against him, killed him, and a new king has taken his place. Now this new king has been in power for a few decades and all of a sudden his most trusted advisor ends up dead and he has to choose a new advisor so he goes to his best friend who he grew up with, Eddard Stark, and Eddard comes down to the palace to be the king's advisor and Eddard discovers that the old advisor kind of left a mystery behind. Maybe he stumbled into something that cost him his life because it seems like he was murdered and the number one suspects in his murder are actually the queen and her family. So a large part of the story is following Eddard as he is trying to uncover that mystery and learning that maybe his life is also at risk and so is the king's. So while all of that is going on, we also follow the two last remaining heirs of that last king. They have fled, but they are still alive, and they very much want to take the power back. And if all of that wasn't enough, dead people are starting to come back to life. What? So yeah, there is quite a bit going on. Let me tell you why I picked this book up. My husband read them. I started watching the show when my husband did, and I absolutely loved the show, but then that made me get to a point where I didn't want to go back and read the books because I felt like I already know what's going to happen. Not to mention the books are quite long, so I was kind of intimidated, but I had always intended to read the books, never did, until I started booktube this past December and everybody was putting on their 2015 yearly reading goals that they wanted to start this book too and I thought why don't we read it together and a lot of people were actually interested in this and we started a read along and that happened in March and it was so much fun that definitely is what finally got me to pick up the book. My overall impression of Game of Thrones is that I found it to be a lot easier to read than I was expecting. Some people say it's just as hard. So that's really just going to vary person to person, but for me, I found it a lot easier to read. It was very gripping. The chapters were just like the perfect length. Things that were happening were perfect to just catapult me into wanting to read more and more and more. It was very long, and it took me about two and a half weeks to actually get through it, but I was never bored enough to want to put the book down and just stop reading. And I don't think that having seen the show really affected my opinion of the book. In fact, it was really fun to go back to the beginning and see and relive where everyone had come from and pick up on a lot of details that really weren't there in the show. So overall, I gave this book five stars. I already knew I loved the story, but I feel like I love it even more now. So let me tell you who I would recommend this book to. I would recommend this to anybody who enjoys fantasy, especially adult fantasy. And if you subscribe to my channel, you probably read a fair amount of young adult books like I do. So if you like YA fantasy such as Throne of Glass, The Winner's Crime, Aragon, or even The Queen of the Tearling, this book is definitely going to still appeal to you. So I would definitely encourage you to check it out. I would also recommend this to readers who love a good old fashioned murder mystery. History. Not only is this kind of a who done it, but a who's gonna do it because every family has it out for each other. If you are wary of dark themes, just be aware that there are plenty of dark and heavy themes in this book, but I will say that every bad behavior is portrayed as bad. So I don't think it really glorifies or romanticizes any of the shady stuff that's going on. Of course there is stuff like violence and sex, but I didn't find anything to be very explicit or vulgar. I didn't have a problem with the way that these themes were presented in the book, but if you have any specific specific questions about what content is in the book, uh, leave me a comment down below and I will definitely try to answer that question. So since I started by watching the show, I want to talk about 
how the book compares to the show. I did feel like having seen the show first really helped me envision things, but then going back and reading the book, there were so many more details in the book. I felt like a lot of the family histories and backgrounds was really lost in the show, how everybody was connected to each other, where the loyalties lay, the history of this world. After reading the book, I did go back and rewatch season one of the show, and at that point, I felt like it was a totally new experience because now I had all of that background information and was seeing it actually play out. I think that you definitely will appreciate the show more if you have read the book and know all of the little details, but overall I think that they just go hand in hand with each other. I think you should probably experience both if you are a fan of either one. Now, the show is overly sexual in nature. They add a lot of unneeded sex scenes, but one strength the show really does have is how the actors bring so much emotion to their characters. For instance, especially in the case of Catelyn Stark. A lot of her choices and character just kind of comes off as cold in the book. But in the show, watching that actress bring that to life, that definitely is a strength of the show, is seeing the humanity. Okay, I'm going to move into a more in-depth discussion now. If you haven't read the book, you probably don't want to hear this because there will be some spoilers. If you've seen the show, it's up to you if you want to stay. If you haven't read the book or seen it or anything, you're going to want to leave now because spoilers are coming. Get it? Like winter is coming, but spoilers. <laughs> It's not funny. One thing I really loved about this story is that it didn't feel like the typical kingdom story where you have like one evil king or ruler and then an uprising with one heroic figure that comes up to face him. Yes, there is one ruler, King Robert, but he's not necessarily evil. He's lazy and not a great ruler, but he's not evil. And all of the other characters in the book, I don't feel like there is one clear villain. A lot of the characters do have both good and bad traits, which was very fascinating to read about. There are some horrible, awful characters in the book. For instance, Viserys. He's pretty awful. I don't think anybody really likes him, but in his mind, he is the rightful heir and he just wants to take back what is his birthright, so he thinks he's doing the right thing. And then Joffrey, he's a brat. I think everybody hates him too, but is it his fault who his parents are? He probably doesn't even know that. He thinks, I'm the prince. I'm going to inherit the throne. This is my right. I should be the king. Why are these people opposing me? Yeah, he's terrible. He's very cruel, which is never a good thing, but by his viewpoint, he thinks he has a legitimate claim to the throne. I feel like a lot of the characters have legitimate reasons. It's very complex. And then looking at a more heroic figure like Eddard Stark, Ned, I don't think there's any question about it. He is very honorable and noble. He embodies so many of the traits of a classic heroic figure. And the story could have so easily just taken that typical route and had him save the day, come out on top in the end, had him make King Robert have a change of heart, but it didn't. It showed that even being a hero and even doing the right thing, you can still end up in a lot of trouble. Ned struggles with so many terrible things like, is sacrificing a few lives okay if it means saving many? Or is it worth standing up to do the right thing if it's going to throw the entire kingdom into war? It was amazing to see him stand up to the king, stand up for what he really believed in, but it just got him into so much trouble that you're left shaking your head like, man, Ned, why'd you do that? Because although he may have a lot of Honor, he also struggles with pride. I think that is kind of a theme going through the book, like at what point are you just being prideful and when should you maybe take a step back and say, hang on, what about the good for everybody and not just me and what I believe in? I think it's easy for us to say what we would do if we were ever faced with that position of would we stand up for what we really believe in, but this book really looks at even if you do, you may still end up losing your head. <laughs> In the end, Ned does swallow his pride and just confesses that Joffrey is king because he's like, okay, you know what, you're right, let's keep the peace. I want to live to see another day and go back to my family. And by then it's just too late. As a reader, I never knew what the right thing for him to do was. I was cheering him on at the same time I was just disappointed in the decisions that he was making. But I really enjoyed the way that this story looked at themes like honor and pride and how the heroic figure isn't always going to come out on top. Aside from Ned, I have always really loved Danny and Tyrion in the show, and it was no surprise to find that I love them just as much in the books. 
Arya kind of went down in popularity to me. I liked her a little bit more in the show than I do in the book, but right now she's just reading a bit typical to me, and I don't think her storyline has done a whole lot yet, but it's going to be very interesting to see in future books. Catelyn really grew on me in the book. In the show I do think that we see a more emotional side of her, but reading in the book and understanding fully where all of her loyalties lie and how she is so divided. She's a mother, a wife, a daughter, a sister, she's a leader, a follower. She has to really weigh what to do in so many different situations and being separated from her kids and her husband and watching her oldest son go off to war. I just really empathize with her and I found her character to be very fascinating because of how all of these things are playing out. My most hated character from the book is Robert Aaron, that little brat. Catelyn's nephew, uh, the son of her sister that lives over in the Eyrie. That kid can go fly. The last character I want to talk about more in depth is Jon Snow. I've never been a huge fan of him in the TV show, but reading the book makes me understand why people love him so much, knowing his background. But the big mystery surrounding him is who is his mother, because we know that Ned apparently will not talk to anybody about who his mother is. There are a few theories about who his mom might be and I do have a video up called my Game of Thrones Crackpot Theories which talks about one of the theories that I formed when I was only 200 pages into this book but now that I'm finished I've seen so many more little clues. If you don't want to hear theories you can mute or skip or click out of this part but all of this is information from book one. So in the book through a lot of Ned's flashbacks, we learn more about his sister Lyanna. There are a few references to her. They're scattered throughout the book, very spaced far apart, but I'm going to mention them in chronological order. Lyanna was engaged to Robert Baratheon, and at one point, Rhaegar Targaryen, who was the last crown prince of Westeros, has a thing for her because he gives her a gift of roses. Later it is said that Rhaegar rapes Lyanna, and then Robert kills him to get vengeance. Lyanna later dies while Ned is with her. She dies while clutching a handful of dead rose petals and it is said that she dies on a bed of blood and she makes Ned promise her something with her dying breath. So if you put all this together, maybe when Rhaegar raped her, maybe she's pregnant with Jon Snow at that point, so maybe childbirth is the bed of blood, maybe she dies in childbirth and she's holding that handful of rose petals which Rhaegar gave to her because it reminds her of him, and her last dying wish is for Ned to raise the son as his own, and so Ned does that, passing Jon Snow off as his own son as if he'd had an affair. But think about it though, the Honorable Ned Stark, do you really think that he would have cheated on Catelyn? Because every other thing that he's done in this book has been so like upstanding. But if this is true and Jon Snow is the son of Lyanna Stark and Rhaegar Targaryen, the Stark blood would explain why he looks so much like Ned. So if he's half Stark, half Targaryen, the title of this series is A Song of Ice and Fire. Starks represent ice, Targaryens represent fire, therefore Jon Snow would be ice and fire in one. And if you don't think that symbolism like that is important in this book, think about the very first chapter when the Stark kids came upon the dead direwolf in the woods when they got their puppies. That direwolf had been killed because a stag had skewed it right through the neck with its antlers. Who do stags and direwolves represent in this series? The stag is House Baratheon, the direwolf is House Stark. And how did it play out in the book? Joffrey, who is a Baratheon by name was the downfall of Ned. You could even argue that it was Robert, the true Baratheon, who set all the events of the book into motion and caused Ned's downfall. Both Ned and the direwolf die, leaving their children behind. It's so poetic how it came back around like that. I definitely think symbolism is going to play a part in this. And of course I'm not counting out Danny because she has the dragons and the fire, and I'm not counting out the wall and the white walkers in winter as representing ice, but I just think it's really interesting to look at. What if Jon Snow is both of these things in one character? He would definitely be very important. But I will leave you with one thought about Jon Snow. If he is the son of Rhaegar Targaryen, Rhaegar was known as the last dragon, and what do we know about dragons? They cannot be hurt by fire, which we see with Danny at the end when she walks out of the burning pyre totally unscathed. But there is a scene where Jon Snow fights the White Walker and he gets his hand burned pretty badly. 
So maybe that kind of contradicts his entire theory. Maybe he doesn't really have any blood of the dragon in him. I don't know, maybe you can argue Rhaegar's not a dragon. Maybe you can argue that the blood was watered down and a half dragon wouldn't be immune to fire, but it's just something to think about. I thought I would leave you with that. I'm gonna end it there and thank you so much for watching this review of A Game of Thrones. If you did the read along with us, let me know how you did down in the comments below. What was your favorite scene, your favorite character, or maybe you DNF the book and that's fine too. Let me know any of your thoughts down below, and I'll see you in the comments. Bye!